All right. Um, good to see you here and all, also the audience. Um, today we are going to talk about the future of technology um, in context of, of democracy, obviously, and participation as well. This is a really hot, hot topic right now. Um, a number of publications have talked about the crisis of democracy, even the decay of democracy. And uh, people's willingness to vote has been diminishing uh, over uh, in the past, uh, past, uh, past uh, years, basically. Especially the younger generations participate less and less actively in politics uh, through elections. For some reasons, the financial crisis or even the rise of the popu uh, populist uh, parties did not put us in the course of any changes. And it seems that the last year has made a big difference. Uh, Brexit, the US elections, and the role of manipulation through social media have sparked a discussion on changes that are needed. So, so it looks like the future of democrat or democratic societies is all but self-evident. And then, so today, I'm really honored to be able to discuss this topic uh, with a number of great people. So, um, Davi Gotka, Limor Schweiter, as well as Nicolas Shea, welcome on stage once Thank more. You. Um, Davi, you're um, definitely an IT visionary and also you worked previously as the chief information officer uh, of the Estonian government. Uh, you're known for basically leading their e-residency e program. So today is actually the third anniversary of that program. Uh, congratulations for that. Thank you. So why did you set up the program in the first place? Why, what did you want to do? As through that? Uh, as you know, uh, I come from a great country. So this country doesn't have a complex uh, to, to become a great again. So we're already great. And, uh, but three years ago, we wanted to become even greater. Like bigger, especially bigger. So we calculated that uh, we can grow our people's wealth faster if more and more people are connected with our economy. And uh, as you know, the, in, in this latitude, the weather is always a slush. So, uh, like, we can't attract so many immigrants and then people from other countries to come to our, our area. So we had to... So you've already given up on that. Yeah, so we had to figure out something totally different. Like, okay, we have to wait the climate change. But, like, so, uh, so we, yeah, we thought that why not to connect those people with Estonia and let's offer them services. And uh, after three years, we can say it's, it's there. It works. All right. Awesome, awesome. Um, Limor, um, you're the founder of a number of robotics companies, including RoboSavvy and Ground Drone. And you have a ton of ideas on how should the future look like where we actually can leverage those machines and build, build better systems. Um, do you have, are there, some things that you don't think robots will not be re replacing when you think about the, the, the work and the future of that? Yeah, the, the short answer is uh, if, you, if you can do a good massage, I think you've got job security. But uh, pretty much anything else uh, that, is, that doesn't require humanism is going to eventually be replaced by either digital AI or physical robotics and the mix. Uh, there's always going to be a competitive situation between automation and humans. Uh, but humanism is going to be on the rise, I think, because automation will replace pretty much every form of uh, labor, that what we call today labor. All right. Yep. All right. And then, Nicolas, uh, welcome. Um, you're the co-founder of Startup Chile as well as Cumple. You also ran for president in Chile earlier this year, right? And, um, and through a party that you've, you've established yourself. So not many people can see you know, that they, they founded several successful startups and initiatives and ran for president. Like, what is the red thread connecting all these projects, if there is any? So, um, well, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, someone had to run, otherwise the party would have disappeared. And I was the president of the party, so I basically, I draw the shortest stick. Uh, so I ran for three months and actually was a very, the purpose of, the, of, the, of running was exactly to, to provide traction to the startup, uh, which worked. I'm very proud for that because we're still around. We had elections a couple of weeks ago. We, we presented 15 candidates. So basically this party, is, it's really cool. It's, it's like a LinkedIn for politics. So anyone just chooses to run, you upload your profile, you say who you are, what you think, what you want to do and then we connect you to citizens. So we did that, we opened it up, 
and we have we had 15 candidates, which were the most the, the least likely politicians you could imagine. You know, school teachers, engineers, graphic designers. So the purpose of the party was exactly as you were saying at the beginning. We need to get involved. We need to bring in more people. Otherwise, democracy doesn't work. Yeah, involvement and participation. Yeah, got it. All right. Hey. Um, by the way, before we continue, if you have any questions that you would like to propose uh, to the participants, so in, in spirit of direct democracy, do suggest them. I have a screen here and I, I will be able to pick those, uh, those questions and, and, and propose them. It's actually them. representative democracy, no? Representative de democracy. That is true. <laughs> that is so true. Uh, if you were shouting, that would be direct democracy, right? Um, so um, before asking what, uh, or actually before asking what we should be doing, uh, the question is, why should we save the democratic um, system that we have? What is there to save and why should we do that in the first place? Well, I would argue it's that it which should be surprising that we're asking that question. It's surprising that that is a question and we ask it all the time. And, um, they were talking about Churchill in the, in the next stage a while ago, and basically it's the least worst of all systems. It's not perfect. Um, and if we want to make it work, we need to participate. I think, and starting by myself and us and Chileans, we blame others. And so we're very comfortable blaming the establishment, the politicians, the political parties from the crowd. And um, it's like, a, so our, Chile is a country, I guess, similar in other countries. It, it's a country that's, it's controlled by the minority shareholders, mm -hmm. and that's ridiculous. So until we don't really decide and, and take the leap and participate, things won't change, and I guess things were, would, would worsen. You, would, you, you were mentioning how uh, participation is diminishing. In Chile, we've been going from 90% to now it's below 50 in the past election a couple of weeks. Um, people say it's a problem, politicians say it's a demand problem, it's, so citizens you know, are lazy or, you know, but citizens will say, you know, it's, it's a supply. The, 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 the offer, the, the, the quality of politicians is so bad. Why would I even, you know, wake up and go to vote? So the only way to change that is to bring more people in. So the, you think that the question of rescuing dem democracy doesn't make any sense because it's not working right now. So there is nothing to rescue, but we actually need to build it. Is that what I, you're I saying? I don't think we have the... I, I would argue that there's no, democ there's no real democracy if you consider the possibilities of 2017. Mm, and with this, there's no critical mass, there's no clear information, there's no accountability. Um, so all of the elements, so basically instead of, we should, we should bring democracy back, we should democratize democracy. Davi, you've been working on a number of uh, different uh, fixes to that, uh, but what's your idea and thought on like, why should we fix, uh, fix the system in the, in the first place? Why is democracy valuable in itself? Yeah, like it was already said, like it's the best one from the worst, <laughs> worst ones. Uh, so if, if you're worried that like young people don't vote anymore so much, like you, you can actually improve this situation with, with, per, with, with proper tools. I mean, like we introduced the uh, possibility to vote uh, like for parliament, uh, et cetera, over internet already like 12 years ago. And uh, what it does, it actually doesn't increase your participation, but uh, it remains. So it doesn't decrease anymore. And it allows people who are actually outside from your country to be still part of your society. And I think that's a very powerful message because uh, the world gets more and more, clo more global. Uh, people live like many years or study many years outside of their place of origin. Uh, we actually ran a study in year 2000 to, to analyze those, those moves and how people feel. And it was an interesting finding that uh, even if you live in Singapore, let's say you are Finn in Singapore, deep in your heart, you're still Finn. And even that this whole globalization and optimization goes on, uh, the relationship uh, between of your birthplace, especially place, not the country, and yourself, uh, that bond becomes, uh, how to say, stronger and stronger uh, with, with, with current globalization. At least that was the outcome of the research. So people like to say that 
like they don't say that I'm, I'm from Spain. They, they they say I'm from Catalonia or like I'm from Bali, not I'm from United States. So so that kind of of, of uh, relating yourself still to the like some let's say place to origin that's important, and I think that's a cornerstone. Uh, whatever we we talk afterwards, like that's the cornerstone that keeps this democracy alive. Exactly, and you yeah. want to be participating in building that place where you're from. Even you? if you are away and you have to, yes, you should have a possibility. And that's very sad that Estonia is still the only country who offers uh, voting over the internet like uh, as a normal thing. Did you have any yeah. resistance? From, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. How do you implement e-voting? E was, was there resistance from the establishment? Was there... Everything in Estonia goes uh, with a one principle, innovation through pain. Innovation? Innovation through pain. So it's always painful to somebody. Innovation is always painful to somebody. <laughs> Limer, what are your thoughts on, on this discussion? So your, your question was, why should we do why? that? So yeah, the, the reason, the, the main fear I think everybody should have is social upheaval or uh, radicalization. And if you look at our history, uh, we are really easily drafted into radicalization and, and killing and slaughter and antisocial behavior. And at the moment, uh, the only area that is not being disrupted through technology is governance. The, the format that we have now in most of the Western world is, is a format that was invented hundreds of years ago when there were a few hundred thousand white men uh, in, with vested interests. Uh, well, to where today you, you consider countries of uh, tens of millions of people, the, the representative democracy really is not fit for purpose. Um, now, it, of course, it objects to change because, because uh, they have a 20-year career plan versus everybody else in the world who has a you know, three-year career path uh, and, and change. Every three years, you change your... Um, so any, anybody who has a long-term career path or a guaranteed career path that is le leeching onto the central pool of money, obviously will try to retain that. You can see that clearly in the, in the, in the military industrial complex, uh, in, in insurance business, in other things that are essentially leeching onto the central pool of money, that, and then the enforcement of tax. We pay taxes. When you buy an, an iPhone, you're essentially, that the government has received up to four times the value of that iPhone. Uh, if you calculate in terms of taxes. So the taxes are increasing. Um, there is more and more disconnect. The complexity of governance is, be is becoming so difficult to get in that, that nobody cares anymore. So, so there's disconnect. And so we need to, we have the tools, and it's just a matter of now um, understanding that if we don't strive to, to uh, modernization, that there's going to be um, uh, antisocial situations. Can I follow up yeah, on that? Yeah, yeah. Because I think what, it's key what you're saying, and, and it's fascinating that like, we assume as citizens, I don't want to use the, cons the word consumer because that's, ideology steps in, but we assume that politics is the exception. Now, all these rules apply for every single other industry sector environment except for politics. What rules are you talking about? Well, when he was the, the politics is the only the, the last sector to be disrupted. Why is that? How come we, we, we tolerate that? We would never tolerate it as a consumer. Why do we tolerate to vote for this? Have the same guy running for office again forever? We know the guy is not going to achieve anything, but we keep on voting for him. It's just ridiculous. We know how democracy works. We don't get involved. So, and, and the problem is ideology. So I think it's the big challenge we need to deconstruct, break down ideology, where there's such a strong bias, historic inertia, whatever, that we will continue to vote for whoever our parents told us to, where, you know, voting is determined by where we were born, etc. We Part of the, our, our project, or the purpose is we need to deconstruct. We need to, there are, there are many projects trying to, you know, just, what, would, what do we stand for? Let, let's, let's agree on causes, let's focus on the issues Let's not just, ideology gets in the way and, and we can, uh, rationality just disappears. So you think that the ideologies work um, as a barriers uh, for direct interaction and that we, need to, we should actually be doing regardless of where we come from. So the interaction and the discussion are the, the means to actually then start getting things done. Is that exactly. What yeah? it's, a, it's, a, it's a poker game. We're all playing poker, we, we're not showing our cards. We should expect politicians to, you know, show the cards. What do you think? What do you stand for in all these issues? What, how can I hold you accountable? 
for A, B, or C. But if we don't know that, there's a good friend of mine says, he's an Argentinian politician, and he says, you know, the maximum of a politician is to say the least and make people think that you'll give the most. Exactly. But, you're, but yeah. you're, you're hitting the symptom, not the cause. The cause is the, is the theater. Uh, anybody who goes into politics inevitably becomes corrupt. It doesn't have to be corruption in terms of gaining money, but he gains power, and therefore he's biased. He's got his, his, uh, his own biases. The trick is how to remove people from power, how to create a system where people are not, have, don't have this power. Exactly. You were mentioning uh, the taxes and the size of the public sector. Now, here in the Nordics, we're actually pretty happy to pay the taxes through the research and statistics. We're re really happy about it, that, you know, to do that because we actually get something out of it as well, uh, like a functioning welfare system. And then we're also part of the top, top five happy, happiest uh, countries in the world. So I'm challenging your, your, your thought a little bit on, on that. Don't you think that we are actually able to build better societies where, through uh, a, an effective tax system where you can then also provide services to people, education, health, and so forth? Yeah, it, the, 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 the Nordic countries and Switzerland, there are some examples of where the political system does provide happiness to the constituents, but that, that's, not, that's a rare example. And I think it has to do with uh, education, and also cultural homogeneity. Um, you can then uh, expect people to behave in a certain way, and, and people who go into the system, into the political system, behave in, an, in, an, in a socially acceptable way. Uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's the exception. And so in the, for the rest of us, I think there needs to be more of a technical view of things uh, to enforce a uh, reflection of what people want. Exactly, exactly. Um, you've been actually working a little bit what is this voice? Something's going on. Um, so uh, we were talking about the challenges, and you've been basically um, thinking about the fixes through the state as a service model. So what are the, the learnings that you've actually taken in the past three years uh, from the e-residency program in uh, light of this, this earlier discussion on, uh, on how can we fix those hey. challenges? Our learnings definitely don't fix those things like you talk about. Uh, our learnings uh, with Everest as a program is that we see that the world is changing. And we see that the disruption uh, will happen in government sector in the same way like it happened in music industry or, or, or in uh, taxi industry or like you name it, Airbnb, Uber. So uh, people will start buying services uh, from governments uh, where it's convenient, efficient, uh, hassle-free, uh, cheap. So that will, that will happen. So, so uh, like, like buying, for example, business environment uh, like for your company, etc. It will be like a, a, it's, it won't be a monopoly anymore like that the, like your own government provided to you. So it, it won't be this way any, anymore soon. So uh, governments will start fighting. Today they're finding, fight, fighting uh, of uh, physical talent who gets best people to their country. But what we have proven is that quite soon governments will start fighting who gets the best virtual talent to do business or being connected with their community. And that's, that will be huge. That will be a huge disruption. Do you have some statistics already from the past three years where you've seen a level of increase in, say, participation in uh, elections or something like that? I mean, like, I see how those people actually create companies in, uh, in Estonia and how those companies operate and what is the benefit for Estonia. So there's a clear economical benefit for Estonia. So uh, there's clear uh, economical benefit for those people. It's a win-win situation. And uh, I mean, I, I can't see why other governments won't start following that. Like. Exactly. Yeah, sounds like a good idea for Chile. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> hey, so um, in addition to, so y you've had this um, state as a service approach to uh, fixing some of the challenges that we, we're currently having. And you're, you're thinking about politics as a service, right? Yes. Is, that the, is that your approach? So what is your actual like, long-term goal with that? What do you aim to do? And what are the steps from now? As you have the party, you, you're setting it up. Like, where do you want to be with that yeah. in the next five years? So again, going back to his point, 
it's an interesting cause or symptom, uh, which one is which, because I think it, the cause of the, pro, the, the problem, we are the problem. So the cause of the problem is that we citizens are not participating as we should. Uh, the reason for that, we could, you could argue, it's, it's such an entrenched industry with the incumbents that have made it so hard for others to come in. There's so much fear for joining politics. No one around you, if, the second you say, the second it was surprising, you know, before declaring I was going to run for president, you would assume like, you know, the, the opponents would resist and some people would criticize you. At the end, no one really cared because I was, you know, just, but, uh, but the biggest resistance comes from your, your inner circle, your family, your friends, your, your business partners. They say, well, are you crazy? What are you doing? So we need to try to eliminate, not eliminate, but diminish that fear, make it easy. So when you think politics is a service, is basically let's provide the service for citizens. Let's make it easier for citizens to jump in. So start with making it easier. In Chile, to, 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 run, to start a party, you need to take 35,000 people physically to a notary public. Um, so independent candidates won't do that. If you, if you register as an independent candidate, you will have to compete against groups, lists of people from the same political party. You will need fund money of people no one wants to fund you. So if you crowdfund, crowdsource, um, pretty much crowd everything. Uh, I think technology is going to play an, an, an enormous, and I'm, I'm extremely optimistic. I see a, a clear eruption of independent citizens joining the game very quickly. Got it, yes. Hey, we have a, a good question coming from the audience, or actually a bunch of them. So let's take one of them, uh, especially this com uh, comes first to Limar. So fake news is already influencing political discourse. How do we manage public debate with social bots and AI become powerful support for tools for, for political elite? So those symptoms are, are today, they're a result of, uh, of uh, arbitrage. If you spend enough money, you can create a uh, political opinion. But, uh, but uh, it's an engineering challenge and it will be fixed. Yes, it's an engineering challenge and basically we, we're just basically, we're able to fix it with the data and with the algorithms that we have. Yes, What's the timeline? Depends on uh, who you're asking, but it's, uh, I think, uh, I'm looking at it from a perspective that, uh, you know, within 10 years we're gonna, we, we may have a world war. And so it needs to be taken very seriously, the whole thing. Uh, yep, yep. And actually, uh, so uh, I discussed with you earlier, and I, um, you had really interesting ideas on the, on the future, how, how we can actually run our, our, our system with as little human participation as possible uh, through direct um, algorithms that just draw the data that is needed and then um, draw the regulations and, and, and plan about the funds and things like that, how the funds and taxes will be, will be spent. And this is a, a kind of an interesting idea now based on what you were just, uh, just mentioning about the, the participation and the actual like, value of that in itself. Can you f reflect uh, a little bit on your, on your thinking on this? Yeah, so this is... Uh this is thinking. I've been collecting a lot of data about, about what's happening around the world in, in, in this domain. And it seems like a, an engineering solution to, to the <laughs> issue. Assuming that the core of the challenge is actually humans in power, uh, is how to, to strive towards removing people from power and, and utilizing technology. So for example, the, the, the ballot system is, 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 is ridiculous. Uh, so, of course, that's easy to fix, you can have. But if you, if you look at uh, the public debate, you can look today at, at Facebook as an example where public debate or Twitter, where it's being done, uh, but imagine one that is, uh, uh, forces a structure into it. So anybody can pose, uh, pose an opinion or, or a challenge or an idea or an improvement, and those are taken seriously through a system, through a, a series of steps, and eventually budget. I think the legislation side is, is separate, but I think the most hurting piece of, the, of, of this all is money. It's like, I give you all my money, and what do I get back in return? Um, and, and it's becoming competitive now to change your, your residency in order to elicit better quality of life or better uh, use of the public spending. Mm -hmm. so, so for the, actually for the, for the high net worth or people who are a high earner, the world is pretty open in terms of where you want to live and what quality of life you want. And, but for the, the majority of the people, you're, you're stuck and, and you're not uh, empowered. But we can have, for example, using virtual reality, the public sphere could be anywhere. You don't have to have the physicality of white men sitting in a big room and, and shouting at each other. 
David, do you have any, any thoughts on that? I mean... Arising from this, these points. Yep. <coughs> no. <laughs> all right, all right. Let's continue. So, so <laughs> what do you think is the role of a third sector in participation and what is the future of that sector? Now, this is coming from the audience as well. The role of third sector. The independent sector? Basically, the, the third sector uh, di referring to NGOs and, and, and um, not uh, the company itself is what I, what I um, read. Uh, very important, maybe the primary role. Um, I think, so in Chile, I, I guess it applies for other countries, but basically, like there's this profession of being a politician. There is this, this, this industry of political parties. We're so used to, as you know, this has been going on for several centuries. Um, and like there are very clear and strict limits between sectors. I think those limits are going to start to blur, which I think is great. Um, we th I think that I think the politicians have been brilliant, brilliant. They've created this sector in which they, they pro they've captured Chilean politicians, if there's any coincidence with other countries. Um, but it's really hard to get in. Barriers to enter are huge. Um, you're supposed to, if you want to be part of the politics, you, you, can, you can't do anything else in life. So basically that eliminates the chances of other individuals, NGOs, independent sector organizations to jump in. I think most people, many more people should jump in. It should be very clear what are your interests, where you're coming from. But if we bring in people temporarily uh, with very clear objectives and, 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 and strong accountability, then we can make politics compatible with other roles, even you know, any other sector. Yeah, cool. Tavi, you had a point on that. Yeah, I mean, uh, I have a, like, additional view to this. Uh, I believe it's, it's not so much NGOs, and, uh, but, but um, the nation states uh, will remain. But there will be another layer on top of that, uh, so-called, let's call them virtual countries, or like, like I'll say, virtual groups. You, you see already the, them forming. I mean, like the, the whole fake news actually proved that they already exist in, in, in certain forms. And uh, those like uh, borderless like groups, let's say, that the people who believe that the world is flat, for example, like, and uh, all the vegans, if they have grouped together, I mean, those organizations, those groups will be way more like influential and, and will start participating also like uh, in, 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 in uh, like being participating like in, in, in elections and stuff where it's interesting for them like so where they want to be influential. What do you think they will, that will happen? Uh, it already happens like you, you see the today they are just puppets uh, that with somebody like somebody's tools like it was in Brexit like case but uh, but it will be like I'll say more and more organized and more and more I'll say dictated uh, how how they will be used, how those groups will be used, how those like communities will be used in in near future. All right, all right. So so far we were talking about basically uh, on a national state, but when we think about the challenges that we have that we need to fix, they're very global actually. They're very global challenges. Just think about climate change, for instance. How can we fix these? massive problems that are very systemic by nature uh, through redrafting and rethinking how we actually decide about things together? It's a heavily difficult question. So, um, like five years ago, I was in Washington and there was a discussion of two politicians and, and someone asked, you know, the, the, the deficit, the, the, the crisis is so obvious, when are you guys going to stop borrowing money from China? And the Democrat congressman said, the minute the Chinese stop lending us money. <laughs> so, you know, when you're in these strong courses, there's like a course of inevitability. inevitability. If we don't get involved, if we don't change the, the, the people, because I don't think we're going to change the way politicians currently are making the decisions. I think part of the challenge is changing the politicians. Uh, it, it, it's so hard for them, where they come from, who they represent, to, I think, change the course of decisions. We need to bring in more people to make in the different positions. And then, you know, I, I don't want, and that's why, you know, people like us 
are getting involved in politics because exactly we need the right people in the right places and that's not happening today. And how is the collaboration going to happen? Yeah, go ahead, Davi. I just wanted to say, I mean, I was the CIO four years, so I worked for the government. I was basically the deputy minister and I saw all this system very closely. And uh, uh, honest answer is, as long uh, like government officers and um, politicians can basically enjoy lifetime career, uh, this system won't change. So you have to disrupt that. And if you're able to disrupt that, then you can start building a new one that might solve those, 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 those very difficult questions that you have raised. Yeah, the, but the before that, challenges. It's, there is no motivation. Yeah, Do you so, agree on that? No. So I think that, again, having the four-year election cycle and people in power is, is not going to address 30-year uh, uh, plans. The only guys around who address the 30-year plan are the Chinese because they are there to stay. So the positive side of that system is that they do address, at least in their own, for their own people, they do address uh, a 20-year plan in order to retain uh, stability. But, uh, but global warming and, and the financial, inevitable financial crisis, we, we're looking at uh, what's called the technology deflation. So there is an exponential uh, uh, de devaluation of, of technology, which we, we, we see the quantitative easing being a, a method of kind of fighting the deflation. But we're on an exponential. I've seen studies that show that this is going to explode at some point. And then in, with the current framework, it's going to lead to radicalization. That's the only way, OK, let's, let's blow things up and see what happens afterwards. And, but I think that the way we, we need to address those things, in the end, data-driven decision-making is the new religion. It's, it's a new way of sort of believing in data as a way to address this complexity. The complexity has reached a point where it's not really about people. People are influenced by what other people think about them and how they retain power. Awesome. I think we have like five seconds, but I'm still going to ask you a very quick uh, row of questions. What is it that you think we should do right now in order to get to the course where we should be in terms of you know, building a, a, a proper democratic society towards the future? Uh, do we start from uh, Nicholas? You probably know this answer because you've been running for the president. <laughs> get involved or get out of the way. Yep. I'm so worried. I mean, I see how this disruption happens at the moment, so I don't have a solution. I just see how, say, my own country can maximize the outcome of that. Okay. I, I'm just um, scared. I try to see, try to predict where the bullets will come from and run away. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so thank you so much for participating in this discussion. Thanks for the audience. And um, yes, um, we will start doing these things, especially I think the first one, what you were saying, Nicholas, on what needs to be done. Get involved or get out of the way, right? Yep. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah.